Well, good morning. I'm glad you could be with me today for our Wednesdays in the Word as we continue on in our unfolding of the Scriptures in the study of the book of Romans. Today we start a new chapter in the book. I'm going to read it. It's chapter 5. I'm going to read the first two verses of that chapter. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. <clears throat> if you've been with me, and I hope you have been, if you haven't, please go back and review some of those previous video teachings. We're in the midst of a study of the book of Romans, and chapter 5 marks a shift in focus within this book. The first four chapters of the book of Romans have been focused on an explanation of the gospel. In the 16th verse of the first chapter, we learned that the gospel of God, of which Paul was not ashamed, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Following that, the rest of chapter 1 into chapter 2, chapter 3, begin to develop for us the bad news. And this is the bad news that everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the bad news is not simply that we are not all we could be, but the bad news is that it matters because sin separates us from God. And ultimately, there's nothing we can do to get rid of the stain of the sin of our life. And the consequence of it, sin separates us from God, hopelessly separates us. And as Ephesians 2 put it, that means that we, because of our sin, are by nature objects of wrath, helpless and hopeless and without God in this world. That's the bad news. <laughs> but once again, you remember, the gospel is about good news as well. And it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The good news is God didn't leave us in that dilemma, that impossible dilemma of the consequences of our sin. But he did something. And what he did is he sent his son into this world to live, to die, to rise from the dead. When Christ went to the cross, it provided a solution to the unsolvable. It provided a means by which our sin could actually be forgiven and the consequences of it removed in relationship with God. And of course, the bad news and the good news inevitably leads to our role in all of this. Our role is not to solve our sin problem, but our role is to respond by repentance and faith to God's solution in Jesus Christ. We are called upon to place our hope, our rest, in the work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf, acknowledging before God our sin and our hopelessness in it, resting instead in what Jesus Christ has done for us. And the consequence of all of that is that we are then justified. Chapter 4 picks up more on that idea of justification, being credited righteous before God, and gave us a variety of illustrations of that truth. Now today, as we enter into chapter 5, we are turning attention to some of the outcomes and benefits of being justified. As the passage begins in verse 1, therefore, <laughs> which literally means as a result of, uh, therefore, since all of that is true about the wonder of the gospel and what has been done on our behalf, therefore, as a result of it, let's make some applications to our lives. By the way, just a quick word. Romans chapter 5, as it begins and says, okay, now therefore, Romans chapter 5 has absolutely no application to those who have never turned to Christ as Savior who are continuing to rest in their own works to try to have some sort of relationship with God. <laughs> it is only those who have turned in faith to Christ and what he has done on the cross on their behalf for whom this passage is written. God has called for us to place our confidence and faith in the work of another, not our works, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just underscoring here that while... <laughs> All of the scripture is profitable to study. Not all of the scripture is applicable because 
Portions of the word of God are only applicable to those who have turned to Christ as Savior. And that's, of course, what we're discovering in chapter 5. Well, let's begin to look at some of this application issue that God is unfolding for us. Because in these opening two verses of the fifth chapter, we encounter three amazing results of being justified, credited righteous by Christ's life in response to our repentance and faith. The three are these. Number one, we've been, because of being justified, we've finally found peace with God. Number two, because of being justified through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we finally have access, complete access, to the Heavenly Father. And number three, because of the credited righteousness that is ours in Jesus Christ as we turn in repentance and faith, we finally can stand before God, not on the basis of what we've been able to do, but instead on the basis of what he's done. We stand before God, continuing to stand by grace and in God's grace. Three amazing things. Peace with God, access to the Father, standing in grace. Now let's look at each of these and unfold them together. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God says, justification brings us peace with God. And by the way, the phrase is well translated here from the Greek. It is peace with God, not the peace of God. Now, why do I make a point of that? Because the wonder of Romans 5.1 and the, the, this, this amazing truth for us is not referring to a feeling, it's referring to a condition. The word arene, which is translated peace here, means to bind together something that was separated. The condition of our lives in Romans 1 to 4 made very plain to us is that due to our sin, we were separated from God. Separated, not together, separated. And as we also discovered, that separation was an impossible separation to overcome. We could not solve the problem that created the separation from God. And therefore, we were hopelessly and helplessly separated from God and facing judgment for the sin and rebellion of our hearts and lives. The gospel, this good news, this amazing power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, is a message all about how one who is separated can become reconciled, how they can be reunited with the one with whom they are separated. Think of how this puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Let me read those verses to you. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And if we weren't unreconciled, we wouldn't need that, brothers and sisters. Well, getting back, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God's making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, talking about Jesus here, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The gospel is all about reconciliation. The solution to the separation that sin has caused. Remember, all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, separation from the God who is really there. <laughs> the fact that we have to understand, to really appreciate why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel, <laughs> is to understand in the significance of the biblical diagnosis that all people are sinners and separated, needing reconciliation. <laughs> 
God goes so far in building on that reality as to tell us that all people are actually enemies of God until they are justified. Now, they may not want to be enemies, but they are enemies until such time as they are justified. The Bible makes it plain to us that we're not just at, we're not just separated from God, but we are also at war with or at enmity with God. Notice how it puts it later in the fifth chapter here of Romans in verse 10. Uh, it says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. I mean, when I read that verse to people, uh, often their response to that verse is, is offense. Like, what do you mean I'm an enemy of God? Well, brothers and sisters, if we are sinners, we are at enmity with God. Sin has turned us into enemies to God. Because sin puts us in a different camp than God, who is holy and righteous and just and loving. And so whether we purpose it that way or not, the fact remains, we are enemies. We are enemies. And repentance, by the way, metanoia in the Greek, change of mind, is changing our mind about our condition, beginning to see ourselves as enemies of God because of our sin. And therefore, wanting to turn from that and be reconciled to God. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we are all, apart from Christ and apart from repentance and faith in the gospel, alienated from God and hostile toward God. It's an admission that must be made to make sense of the gospel. Colossians 1, starting in verse 20, puts it this way, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, talking about the work of Christ here, whether on heaven or in earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in him. All right, what's the biblical diagnosis? What does the scripture say? The scripture says, I and you, before we turn in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ, we're not only sinners and separated from God, we were uh, enemies of God. We were alienated from God. We were hostile toward God in our minds. That's the truth. It's what God has to say. Then part of repentance is acknowledging all of that before God and saying, God, that's exactly right. That's in fact where I was, what I was, but I turned from that. I turned from reliance on myself. And in humility, I turned to Christ and I want to rest in the work he has done. I want to find peace through his shed blood, as Colossians 1 puts it. I want to rest in the work he's accomplished for me rather than trying to earn my acceptance with you. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, directed by the Holy Spirit, says these words in the 48th chapter, verse 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. If we understand that, then isn't this first verse of the fifth chapter an amazing verse? Since, therefore, we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no peace if we're wicked. If we have sinned, we are wicked. <laughs> the gospel does something to totally transform the reality of our life, and therefore, because of the credited righteousness of Christ, the fact we are covered in his righteousness, God now sees us differently. And instead of there is no peace for the wicked, now there is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's death and his resurrection were the answer to the reality of no peace, unreconciled, alienated condition that all of us were in. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Then upon him was the chastisement that has brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. The condition of peace, reconciled, that's the wonder of the gospel.
The gospel says God loved us while we were still his enemies, alienated, hostile in our minds, sinners. And he offers us forgiveness and peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Later on in the fifth chapter, in verse 8, it says this, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, we'll talk much more about that particular verse as we get to that part of the fifth chapter uh, on another session. But there's the message for us. Reconciliation at last. Justification brings with it peace with the one before whom we were alienated, unreconciled, at war, hostile, under judgment. What a wonderful outcome, isn't it? <laughs> Justification gives us peace with God. It then goes on in the second verse, and it says, And through him we've also obtained access by faith into the grace with which we stand. The second result of being justified is this, that now we have freedom of access to our Heavenly Father, we can come into his presence with freedom and boldness. The gospel tells us not only that in Christ we can have peace at last with God, it also tells us we have access to the Father. This word access translates a Greek word which literally means to bring face to face. The Lord Jesus Christ in his work on the cross on our behalf has opened up the way, in fact, the only way, for us to approach the Father and to be there face to face. Let's look a little bit further at this and understand why that's so important. The truth of the matter of the human condition is this. Sin blocks our access to the Father. It blocks it now. It separates us from God. And it blocks it forever, because it can separate us forever if we don't have a solution to that sin. No one, apart from the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross, could approach God because they are sinners. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah, a godly man and one who God used in the Old Testament, has a vision of God's presence, and he comes into the very presence of God in the throne room of heaven. And and he says, upon seeing him, he says, oh, woe is me, I am undone. <laughs> I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. Isaiah saw the truth that is a truth today for you and I and everybody. <laughs> we sin cannot dwell in the presence of the God who is there. Woe is me if there's no solution to my sin. I can't just freely have access to the Father. That, by the way, was in the Old Testament the reason for the sacrificial system from the time it was put in place, really from the garden, but in much more detailed way from the time of the Exodus journey. The sacrificial system provided a temporary way for people who are sinners to offer sacrifices to temporarily cover sin until such time as the ultimate perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was it all necessary? Because sin inevitably and impossibly separates us from God. We just don't have access to God. It can't happen because we are sinners. But Christ, when he died on the cross, his death on the cross worked a miracle and made a way of access for us that was previously closed to us. You know, this was very graphically demonstrated uh, in the Gospels. In, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, 50, verse 51, in talking about what happened at the moment that the Lord Jesus Christ actually died on that cross, one of the descriptions of what occurred at that time was the miracle that the veil in the temple was ripped apart from the top to the bottom. Now, what's that about? Well, the veil was what separated the Holy of Holies in the temple from access by anybody because people were sinners. 
Once a year, on behalf of the people, the high priest could offer the blood of atonement there. But the rest of the time, there was no access to the Holy of Holies. People could not come before God and live. Hence, Isaiah's message in Isaiah 6, woe is me, I'm undone. My eyes have seen the Lord, I'm in trouble because I'm still a sinner. In the cross and upon the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, God, on his initiative, took that veil which separated his presence, even in the temple, from the people. He ripped it apart, starting at the top down to the bottom, meaning God had to do it, not men. It wasn't something we ripped out from the bottom up to him. He ripped it out and made access to him available to those who would place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, you and I, having repented and believed in the gospel, can now boldly come to the presence of God. The world presumptuously thinks they can do that anytime they want, but no one has access to the Father except through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we have. I was thinking of how this develops it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Listen to these words. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we have access at last, Jew or Gentile, by faith to the Father. Hebrews 10 picks up on this as well. Let me read these verses to you, starting in verse 19 of Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of the Lord Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure waters. We have confidence to enter the holy place. We can boldly draw near with full assurance of faith that we can come into the presence of God because we are covered in the righteousness of Christ. He is our righteousness. And the sin that separates us from God has been removed. It's a miracle, isn't it? It is a miracle. And it's part of the wonder of justification. You and I don't need to go through anybody in order to get to God. Only through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We don't go to God through the saints. We don't go to God through Mary. We don't go to God through ceremonies. We don't go to God through rites and sacraments. No. We come to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that has opened up for us a way through the curtain. Are you understanding what miracle it is to be the children of God? Peace with God. Access to the Father. Finally, through him we also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Justification is already has also brought with it proper standing before God, standing rooted in the grace of God, not our own works. Justification has changed our standing. Now that term standing, think of it in sort of a legal term. It's like you came into the court, then you're accused of something, and how do you stand before the judge? On what basis are you arguing your case? On what basis do you want the judge to rule on the case against you? We have the opportunity to stand be, to come before God standing on our own relative righteousness, or we can stand before God on the offer of grace found in the Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect righteousness. Understand this warning in the scriptures. In Psalm 130, verse 3, it says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? What a great phrase, because it ties to what we're looking at here. And the answer to that question, of course, is nobody could. Nobody could. Isn't the miracle now of justification that as far as the east is from the west so far has our transgression and sin been removed from us? That we have the perfect life of Christ crediting us? As 2 Corinthians puts it in chapter 5, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
In Revelation, the final book of the scriptures, in chapter 6, verses 12 to 17, it says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Nobody can stand before God based on anything in their life. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can stand. Stand on grace. We'll either try to stand before God based on what we've earned, or we will choose to stand before God based on the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no hope for anybody based on their works. In chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, the passage dealing with what's called the great white throne judgment at the end of time, it says all will stand before God and the books will be opened. And there will be another book. The books that are opened are the listing of all of their actions, their attitudes, their thoughts, their deeds. There's another book, the Lamb's Book of Life. And it says, if anyone's name is not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, <laughs> they are cast out of the presence of God forever. You and I have no hope based on works. We have every hope based on the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We stand by grace, God's unmerited favor to us in response to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We who once, as Ephesians 2 put it, were helpless and hopeless without God in this world, now have a future in a hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 15, I'm sorry, verses 1 and 2 says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand. So again, we're looking at this phrase, stand. We who were once helpless and hopeless, <laughs> separated from God, can stand in the gospel. Justification says we stand now, and we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, the coming glory eventually to be demonstrated everywhere in the expression of his kingdom. We're part of that and we'll be part of that. What great wonders are ours because of justification? Number one, peace with God at last. Number two, free access to the Father, coming before him at any point in any time. And finally, standing no longer based on our best efforts, but standing based on the perfect life of Christ. God's expression of grace to us. Do you have peace? Do you have access? Do you have grace? All tied to repentance and faith. Well, join me next time as we push forward in the fifth chapter here and discover more of the wonder that is ours as justified people before the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless.